<laughs> well, good evening and welcome back to Mystic Hour, a live podcast about all things mystical and nerdy right here on Proficiency Bonus. I'm your host, Christy Mystic Water, and each week we will be having some cool discussions with cool people discussing all the geeky fandoms, hobbies, and cultures. Uh, before we begin, uh, just a few quick shout outs to Streamlabs, OBS, and Twitch, Many Sided Dice for their support of the stream, and also... Uh, thing to note for announcement all this month we are collecting bits and donating them to the zephyr foundation up in new jersey for autism awareness month so any bits that you guys donate this month will all be sent to them it's pretty great so definitely do that and uh tonight we are going to be talking about dungeons and drama continuing the same vein and theme of the month uh this Tonight we are talking about designing and drama and designing D&D and the correlation between D&D and theater. So I'm going to bring you guys over. There they are. Say hi, guys. Hi. Hi, hi guys. All right. <laughs> so today we have Ani, Sierra, Jim, and Ink. And par usual, we're just going to go around the table and get everyone to introduce themselves again. Let them know where you're from, what you do, any shout outs you or plugs you want to insert, feel free. And we will start with Ani. Hi, I'm Ani. I am on the Thursday game, um, Delvin Dash. I play Raz. That's my connection to this random group of wonderful people. Um, I am from Minnesota. Um, and I've been playing D&D &D for a little, I don't know, close to like a year and a half at this point. And I've done a bunch of different acting and uh, stagecraft and stuff like that um, through high school and college. Cool, cool. All right. I don't know. Was that everything? Was there anything else? Nope. I think you covered it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You covered your bases. Awesome. Uh, Sierra. Awesome. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> ah. Ah. Um. <laughs> yeah. Like she said, I'm Sierra, aka Little Lady Mayhem. I am a writer, artist. And somewhat laissez-faire actor. I've been in theater for a very long time, since like high school. Been in and out. Um, but I've been writing since I was in sixth grade. Mm. So, big fan fiction writer and anything supernatural yeah. and fantasy. Um, and I am connected through this lovely group um, on our Saturday games with Christy. Is on Insight Check. Saturday. Where I play a... Yeah. Wonderful, strong, beautiful Sonata. And that's it. <laughs> she needs to wear her protection at all times. Yeah, always wear protection, guys. <laughs> all right, next we have Jim. <laughs> Can you hear us, Jim? <laughs> oh, no. Par usual. Oh, God. Proficiency <laughs> bonus. Technical difficulties. <laughs> Jim, 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 Jim. Jim. Oh, Jimbo. He looks so attentive. I know. <laughs> Jim, it's you. <laughs> Is he frozen? No, he's dead. He's dead. Oh, no. <laughs> he just died. Well, he's he dead, just looked Jim. very attentive. Oh, no. Oh, oh, no. Oh, Am hey. I back? You're back. Yay. 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 Hooray. Hooray. Oh, hey. you. I'm I'm great. What was the thing you heard? <laughs> Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Okay. Sorry. Right, I'll sign. I'll sign it to you. All right. Um, we couldn't see anything either. Well, hey, oh. Oh dear. Well, hey y'all. Uh, I'm Jim, and I am in the Curse of Strahd game. I play Rail Iron Fur, yeah, a tobacco. Oh no. I'm from. Uh, did you drop me again? Yeah, we dropped for a minute. Coming in and out. You're coming in and out. It's we got you now. He's in China. Yeah, he's in China, <laughs> so let's preface this for technical difficulties sake. He's in China, so we're getting a little bit of a dropness, but where are you from? Where are you? You're from Texas, right? Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> that is what he had said earlier. He had said it. Yeah. Yes. You want to move back to West? Maybe. Yeah, okay, guys, one second, because I think me moving to this Central made it worse. 
So I'm going to move us over to west and hopefully it works. Sorry about that, guys. Technical difficulties! We called this like ages ago that this was going to happen. The moment we need someone to talk, mm -hmm. technical difficulties fucks us. So, you know. It is China. Yeah, it is China. Well, yeah. in the meantime, while we wait for Jim to get back, Ink, you want to go? Yeah, sure. Hi. Uh, I'm Ink. I'm the guy that's never referred to by his name, but that's fine because I'm Ink. Uh, I am a illustrator, uh, and I also write, and I acted a little bit when I was younger in high school theater and short film. Uh, gosh. I don't know. Oh, I play. Yeah, <laughs> I play Varian. Do do? <laughs> I, pl I play Varian Vandeveld on uh, on Curse of Strahd with Jim on Saturdays, and I DM on I DM on this channel sometimes. I forget on Wednesdays. <laughs> on Wednesdays. Sometimes I DM my campaign uh, wish, which is very good. Yes. And I have a book. Yeah, I always I forget guess. that I have a book, so I have a book. This is my book. Yeah. But it's. But that's neither here nor there. I mostly draw on Twitter. Dabs. <laughs> Do we got you back, Jim? Hello. All right, your turn. How am, I, how am I coming in? You're sounding better. Good. Sounding better. Fantastic. Um, I guess I have to stay on whist. Okay. Um, so I need to say the shortest thing possible in case I break out again. Um, I'm Jim. I play Rail on Curse of Strahd. I am a writer and did lots of theater, acting, and uh, directing. There it goes. Oh. And directing. In high school. There you go. Okay. <laughs> also, hello it. to the cat who is now visible. <laughs> hello, cat. All right. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think I think I think we got everybody. I think we're good. Yep. So okay. let's start. Let's start the questions. <laughs> <laughs> so the first one is pretty basic. We, you guys kind of touched on it a little bit, but I want to little dive a little bit more into it. Is when and how did you get into theater or acting or improv? And I'll start with Ani. Okay. Um, so I did. Um, actually, the first play I ever did was when I was in kindergarten. Um, as I was telling you guys, I was a cockroach. It was pretty great. Um, and then I did one other show when I was in like second grade had a horrible experience with it because the director wasn't good and then ended up not doing theater until my sister was graduating and i was like i want to do one more show with you um and so i started back into it my sophomore year of high school and really really enjoyed it i did a bunch of awesome plays i did peter pan i did um oliver twist hey which is by I've far my favorite Hey. um also did the pied piper which was utterly ridiculous but pretty fun and the king and i um, oh wow! And so that was sort of what I've done acting-wise. Um, stage. I also did a bunch of like set construction and backdrop painting yep. and stuff like that throughout those yep. productions because it's community theater, so everyone yep. does everything. Yep. Um, and then I did. Uh, I got to college, and I just didn't have the energy to do theater. Plus, I was a science major, so it just didn't work out well. Mm. Um, and so. I ended up working um, stage tech for events and operations. So I wasn't actually doing theater programs, but I was doing all like the um, different performers that came in to perform at the college. And so I was helping hanging lights and that kind of thing. I also did some um, theater tech classes. Um, and so I've done costume design. Well, okay, technically it was cosplay, but it was costume yeah, design. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, co um, it is costume design for sure. Yeah. Yeah, but the class was literally called cosplay. It was pretty great. Um, and I've done lights, and then I haven't really done sound is sort of the only thing that I haven't haven't done much of. Okay. Um, so you're pretty, but... like, diverse on the theater side <laughs> thing, then. Yeah. yeah. I've also even turned pages for the pianist set of play, so, oh. like, I've, I've, I've done everything <laughs> from, from acting, yeah. Because it was my last semester in high school and I was like, I don't really want to do the play because I don't have time because I have a bunch of AP. Mm -hmm. And then it was also the um, the show was Pinocchio, which is utterly terrifying. I hate that show. Um, <laughs> so I was like, I don't want to be in it and live this for four months. So instead I just turned pages and it was good. Cool. 
What about uh, you, Sierra? When and how did you get into theater, improv, acting, etc.? Okay. Well, the theater thing, I'm going to be honest. This might sound a little creepy, but I'm not too out of my mind. But I used to always, like, play, like, little scenarios in my head. And I would just act it out walking around. Me too. So... So people would think I'll be talking to myself. I'm kind of talking to myself, but I'm performing a role. So that's something else. <laughs> um, also, when we, when we were kids, me and my brother used to um, dress up and play make believe and all this other craziness. I mean, we sort we sort fall in the kitchen. We had a dog that was a dragon. Oh, <laughs> that's all. <awesome>. Oh! <laughs> we used to do all this crazy stuff. Um, and then, like, since then, it was, like, I started getting into role-playing a lot. Mm. So I just always wrote. Um, I just got used to being a different character every time that I was Like the playing. online forum RP? Yeah. yeah. So Guy Online. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Guy yeah. Online. <laughs> Basically. Guy, like, oh, shit. Yeah, that's that's really old. Wait, <laughs> yeah, that's how you date us. <laughs> guy Online. <laughs> That's what I did for like hours and hours on end. Um, and then I think my first play that I actually got involved in was Little Shop of Horrors. Ooh. I was supposed to be Mr. Mushnik, but since it was like that year, I was in a lot of classes. So I was like an understudy. I think that's what you call him. Yep. So in case the main character just end up <laughs> not being able to do it, I can just switch in. So I knew the lines from Mr. Mushnik. Um, and then during that too, I got part of the drama club in high school where, um, we did like this hip hop version of Cinderella. Ooh. Oh, that's cool. And yes. mixed in with all this, um, different type of fairy tales. So I, I played the queen. I love when they do, like, they mix the musicals. With I all did. The other we did I good. That stuff. Yeah. It was so fun. Um, I was the queen. So it was awesome. I was all you dramatic and extra. It's very accurate. Oh. It's not even a role at that point. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and then I picked up college recently, um, college acting courses in theater. And I'm po actually supposed to be taking another theater class next semester. Ooh, so nice. kind of getting in the roles and stuff and kind of helps me a lot. Yeah. Cool. Nice. Uh, what about you, Jim? When, how... Where did you get into theater acting improv? Um, I recall as a, as a child that there was a lot of kind of play acting between me and my sisters. We've got I've got two sisters, and we would often put on these little performances. Um, but I guess where I really got into acting was when my family, for a year, we moved uh, a little bit north of texas to go to tennessee for a year and i was a new kid i wanted to you know try all kinds of things i managed to kind of alter myself a little bit by going by a different name and i thought hey let's try band and let's try acting and so i was just trying a little bit of everything and the band you know worked out okay but i really fell in love with uh with with acting and with being on stage and we did uh, we did a play uh, called The Man Who Came to Dinner. That sounds familiar. That there's really a, does. It does. There's a there's a writer who comes into this really small town, and this family puts him up. He slips on ice on their doorstep, breaks his hip, and has to, uh, like, stay in their house. It's mm -hmm. the most convenient to stay in their house, and he just like turns their whole life, you know, upside down. Not yeah, not I always in a positive way. Yeah. I I feel like I've seen that, or at least read it. Yeah. Interesting. Cool, cool. So, um, are I think Ink, you've already answered this question. Do you kind of want to just do a recap? Yeah, I mean, uh, last week I, I I talked about how I I unearthed uh, repressed memories of being Munchkin right. number th Munchkin number three. <laughs> yes. In in a production of uh uh, uh wow why am i i always uh, wizard, of wizard of oz yeah in wizard of oz i always want to say <laughs> wonderland and then i'm like no no different girl goes to a magical land right yeah 
uh, and then uh, kind of just progressively moved up through that, did choir, then kind of went to a private school which had a good theater program, got roped into doing more and more and more and more until I was just full-blown theater kid, infected. And then did, like, summer uh, short film festival stuff yeah. where I directed and acted like that, yeah. It's so cool. Yeah, I've mentioned before that the school I went to, Betty Huff Elementary, is pretty much like a theater school at this point because of St Steve Swadling. He's a grade 7 teacher, but he's also the acting coach and director of the school, and he's been doing this for, gosh, over 20 years now at this point. And because of him, that school has now put on huge plays that are almost always sold out, over 200 tickets each each night, like sold out. He's amazing. And because of him and that experience and how involved the entire school, like grades K to seven, all get involved in these theater productions. So I've been in heavily involved in the theater scene since then, since kindergarten, learning how to set up stages, learning your where where the markers are learning how to do lighting so all of that i i've learned from that school and steve's fuddling props to him if you ever are in the area definitely go check him out um so the first question um i don't know how many of you are dms how many are you how many of you have dm'd before oh so it's <laughs> great so, that being said, all of you have this is a round, resounding yes. So, what are notable works you've created for your campaigns or one shots? Or something you're proud of? I made that really big map. Yeah, that just was the cool. other. I recently made a really, really big old map for my homebrew campaign. That's like, it's all it's all digital. So I have like digital rulers to know the distance between everything and all my towns and stuff. And it's like bigger than the United States. It's like almost like thirty five hundred miles across. Yeah, that's insane. I did a map. Whoa! Oh, He's nice. got a map. I did this myself. Oh, I like so this. Cool. Oh, so cute. So cute. <laughs> Awesome. I just I cheated with the map that I made. I literally just took a map of Iceland and turned it upside down. <laughs> <laughs> upside I thought down. about, I I thought about doing cheated. stuff like that before. It worked really well though, because like no so one knows what Iceland looks like, and so like and so I just used their like, provincial say, divisions and just turned that into countries. It was great. Oh jeez. <laughs> like like as as a writer, you know, especially for for like fantasy. Um, it's sometimes difficult to avoid, mm -hmm, you right. know, looking like a carbon copy. And so what you do is you just take something, you know, you take something yes. real yes. and then, and then you alter it. Mm -hmm. And I think we've touched so, on this before on Mystic Hour that we kind of just like embrace your roots, embrace your inspirations because like, that's how the creative process starts. Like you always have mm -hmm. to start with an inspiration usually, but like you're, it's not always just you You're, there's always going to be influences from your from your life experiences so i feel like that's that's true not just for acting and theater <laughs> directing but i think that's also true for like artists and writers as well so mm -hmm. yeah yeah i think the only thing i really created like that i'm proud of <laughs> is um the lore mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. i create like a homebrew most of my stuff is usually very homebrew because I don't want people to be like, oh, this seems kind of like just a simple fantasy run. Mm. So I always try to mix it up with stuff. Um, I think I did the lore kind of like a... I usually did the same thing with my writing. I put a lot of spiritual aspects in it mm. and a lot of mythology from mm, I love mythology. Just, yeah. yeah. Just from like my cultural perspectives of... Um, African American and African heritage is more of um kind of take a lot of influences from that. Um, so I think that's like the most thing, and I have created like little one shots that I do, <laughs> just like little fan works of it because I may be shipping some players, and I just yeah, kiss. Yeah, that's me. 
cousin. I mean, that's the fanfic writer in all of us just now kiss. I got I got to do it. I can't help it. <laughs> but however, one time I actually got a message like two weeks ago from a campaign that I used to DM. And he messaged me saying that because of me, he found the love of his life. Aww. So they're Aww. actually like, I found my best friend and I just wanted to let you know that you were very important in that and you actually led us to meet. And I was just like, oh. I was like, oh my make God, I'm so much happy for you. Make me a match. <laughs> oh. That's, I'm that's stupendous. Oh. And that's that made awesome. me I love so that. happy. I think that's if my greatest accomplishment. Married, you, should, you should do a D&D. Oh, wow. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> I mean, oh, if you think goodness. about it, like, how many people get together because of, like, Critical Role or just the D&D yeah. in general? Like, a lot of people meet because of, of things like that. So, th- you did that! Oh, that's so cute! I was so happy for him. That is my greatest achievement. Oh, and I didn't I love do it. anything. I love it! <laughs> I, I can't even anything. top it! <laughs> no, that's awesome. Yeah, my... I think my best one because i haven't done dming a lot but i think my proudest one well creative wise i really liked what i did with the moon kingdom i pretty much made an anime into a one shot and transferred all my players to the moon kingdom from sailor moon on the second moon of exandria so that was that was a cool creative idea that i was really proud of but um another thing i was really proud of is when I did the bubbles one shot and made all of my friends save all of my characters that they play with in different campaigns <laughs> and forced them into that situation, which has now resulted in Mulfin going forward with uh, my character Callista and their connection to Asmodeus. And Michael has taken my simple little one shot and has turned it left, turned it into a real quest line in our campaign. So that. <laughs> That made me very proud that something like that he kind of took up and ran with it. So that was cool. That is quite huge. That was, I love it was it. pretty huge for Mulfin and Asmodeus. And now Callista's involved because I made her involved. It was my own fault. I did it to myself. Jeez. Uh, uh, Lip was asking, Jim, how did you get into directing? Um, directing kind of fell into my lap. Um for the advanced theater uh, classes that I took in high school, we each had an opportunity to do a senior direct. And I had been an actor in one of those senior direct plays the, the year before and kind of fell into being, I guess, assistant director. It was never any official title, but uh, Hillary would often uh, throw tasks my way uh, I guess, I don't know why she chose me, but I was not very responsible then, but she would often throw tasks, you know, to me, uh, just to get them done. And so whenever it was my turn to, to direct a play, I thought, yeah, yeah, sure. I'll go for it. And so I, I, uh, really found out how many different hats the theater director wears, mm, which, is, which is very similar to, to a DM. A DM yes. that you constantly are having to think and stretch yourself in new ways. And so I had to pick the music. I had to choose the lighting. I had to design the set. I had to pick everything. And so, and you know, all of the stress falls onto your shoulders as well, especially when, you know, your actors decide, eh, it's not really what I want to do. And they quit halfway through the production. Uh, and you have to yep. Been that. there, done that. My Kill first time directing, like over half my cast just kept bailing and not showing up for every week. Every couple weeks they would come yeah. in and I'm like, well, this is not how you act, guys. This is not how you do rehearsals. Like, fuck. <laughs> oh, yeah. So like, I, I had a, I had maybe a four person play that I was doing and Two dropped out. What was the show? And I, was... and I was already one of them. So I, I decided to do uh, my favorite play, which is Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. Oh. Okay. It is uh, about two minor characters from Hamlet, who yes. whenever Hamlet goes to you know England, they're supposed to deliver a message to kill him, but he switches them and they die instead. The whole play... Uh, is about them being dead 
kind of watching the events of Hamlet from the outside oh, and not really understanding what's going on. They know that they're Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, but they don't know who is who. Oh. It's it's a fantastic play. They made a movie about it. Uh, yeah, it sounds uh, familiar to me. Tim Roth and Tim Roth and Gary Oldman. It was a great film, but which was written by uh, the writer of the play. Lip says, "I love that p- play. The absurdist like crazy. It's the absurdist My like man. crazy. Yes. <laughs> Next time on Mystic Hour, therapy for gamers slash actors who drop out halfway. <laughs> 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 Mood. <laughs> Mood. All right. Um." Next question. What does visual stimuli like character art, handmade scrolls and items, costuming do for your sessions that you don't get playing in theater of the mind? Ani? So I've never played a game in person. Um, All of my stuff has been through Discord and Roll20, um, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So... I can't speak to like sitting at a table kind of thing, but um, I think me and Lip were actually sort of talking about this last night. And one thing that came up was not so much what games we play, but um, the difference between um, the adventure zone and critical role. Yes. Um, Yes. Because critical role is very visual, very, we have canonical appearances of these people, Mm -hmm. you know, Whereas Taz, they very specifically did not have a a canonical character design. And so what I think is interesting, I think, is it just opens up to people to create their individual things. Because you'll get tacos who are black, tacos who are white, tacos who are blue. Like, and I just love, like, the different body types and all that stuff that people get for the same character. But it's how they see them. And I think... For me, that really helps me feel like I'm part of it because it's like I can sort of imagine, oh, they could look like me, you know, whereas like Mm. if there's a set canonical, like, here's what they look like. It's like, oh, okay, that's what they look like. But it doesn't matter then what I think they look like. And so, I mean, like I've done some drawing and stuff of like my character and that kind of thing, my characters that I play. Um... But it, what they look like changes as we play. Yes. Um, Mm -hmm. Like, Yuke's the character that I play on Sunday with Christy and Lip. Um, What Yuke's looks like, looked like when I started the game and what Yuke's looks like now (laughs) are not the same thing. And so I think sort of having that sort of theater of the mind allows me to change that as it fits her and not feel like I have to keep how she looks because that's the canonical look, you know, like, and so I, I obviously can't really speak much to the other way of it where you have that kind of thing. But to me, it just doesn't, doesn't appeal quite in the same way. I think just because it would, it feels a little more limiting to me. Interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah. What about you, Sierra? Um, I'm kind of like in the middle of both, actually, same. because I, I mean, love I, yeah, I love visual stuff. Like I love the maps. Like I, when I'm in person, like my first D and D game was ever was in person. So it was like he had he rolled out this big old map. He had the figurines, and I was like, oh, okay, this is pretty fucking cool. <laughs> so I enjoyed it, and I think the best thing I like about visual stimuli is the music. I think music really mm, entraps me yes. and gets me into a mindset of how how am I going to play this I character right now? Music. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> yeah, because it's like with sometimes like certain music hits you and you'd be like, okay, yeah, this is a very Shit's sad going down. moment. Or, yeah, yeah it's, it's like, oh no, we like, have to be serious and not fuck around <laughs> for a minute. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> like, I'm not going to, like, if there were times. Like in our game, if it, it, it was times an inside check that had music and, like for instance, when the town was destroyed, when Soul Mine was destroyed, I feel like that probably would have heightened Sonata's like mm. emotional attachment because it's like, well, damn, mm-hmm. you can describe a town being like fucked up, but then also having a sound that sound effect of people screaming or just absolute silence. It's like. 
that plays a lot into the mind. Mm-hmm. And the thing is with characters too, I, I, I'm kind of on the fence a little bit, like how um, Ani said, it's more like, like, I love the interpretation of it. I like when you feel like, oh, yeah, this character might look like me. This character might not. Like, take Keyleth. I've seen interpretations of Keyleth for, mm-hmm. like, different versions. I've seen her with darker skin. I've seen her with, like, the that looks more like Marisha Ray. Right, yeah. So I'll be like, oh, okay. And I, I see three. That's kind of cool. Like, I, I do like that. But I also like the... Like, if I feel like if someone were to draw Sonata not black or not with that tight, kinky hair, I feel like I might feel a little upset. I was like, hmm. well, that's kind of, like, very important to her right, character. Right, right. Like, I think really big traits like that is kind of, like, as long as it doesn't take away the whole cultural aspect or the story-wise, like, the whole plot point then I think that's good because it's like Sonata wouldn't be Sonata if she wasn't half drow right. that looked like a mixture between all that. Right. So I think stuff like that. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. It's like it adds to that character backstory and everything. It's important. But if it doesn't add to that, I feel like it's good to just leave it up to interpretation. I agree. I agree a hundred percent. What about you, Ake? Um, I mean, all of, I've never gotten to actually, like, play at... Well, that's technically not true. Now that I've gone to PAX, I have gotten to play at an actual table. Um, and I'm, I'm like, a really big minis guy. Like, everyone I know is, like, dice fiends, but, like, I, I get a lot of minis. Like, that whole little, like, chest over there is, like, where I... That's, like, all, all my minis are in there. Mm-hmm. It's, like, an old jewelry... Mm-hmm. It's an old jewelry box, so it like, all unfolds... Like the mini tro- tro- treasure yeah. chest. And there's something honestly really satisfying. There's... Uh, I, I, I can understand, like, you're going to your game, especially if it's, like, at a table with your friends in person, and you've got your, li- you've got your little dice bag, and you've got your mini, and you're holding it, and it's like, that... This is, It's my little me. You know? Yeah. Because... Because... I feel like it makes those moments, especially, like, losing a character, mm. you know, losing a character and, like, watching, like, like taking the mini away. Mm. Or, you know, you put it, you, you, you know, you actually have to physically watch the character go down, I think, like, who? And then, man, if you're, if, if, if you're really, if, if you're really good, your DM goes, hand me the character sheet. Oh, yeah, that, those moments. Because that's yeah. like, because that's like, ooh. Oof. But I mean, when you're the like artist in the friend group, or even sometimes more importantly, like the crafty person, when someone's like, I open up the the chest, and the DM's like, there's like a rolled up letter, and it's like, well, what does it say? And they go and they reach down and they give you a little rolled up letter with like a little wax seal on it. You like, I feel like it encourages role play. Yes. It, it, because because now it's just it's not just someone telling you, oh, you read. Right. It's you're being physically handed the thing and you have to hold it out. And I guarantee you they'll read it in their character voice. Um, you know, so I think I think visual things oh. like that. Oh. I think Jim. I think I murdered Jim. Jim just got stabbed in the back. The letter. Oh, no. The letter was. A, the letter was a kill order. <laughs> I believe. No murder, please. I believe that 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 like physical things like that enhance or encourage role play. Um, and also, I mean, obviously, using an actual map and minis uh, leads to a lot more tactical battles mm. because you're actually you know if you're busting out like the tape measure yeah and you're and you're doing your line of sight one of the games that i played i did like an arena game where we were and they built it was this whole table and it was all an arena there was 12 players oh. versus we were all facing each other but then also fighting tiamat and you got points for kills and stuff it was very interesting because you weren't just controlling player models, you were also controlling mo- You basically, you you got four random minis, and you got character sheets based on those minis. So it was a very hmm. physical, visual-oriented 
thing and i mean i one of my guys was an archer and i saw ruins and i was like count, i could count the squares and be like can i climb up here and i literally like climbed up into this ruins and i'm shooting tiamat through an arrow slit because i could see that there was an arrow slit and it's like being able to see all that definitely enhanced the tactical gameplay, mm-hmm. but some people don't like that mm-hmm. because it slows things down. Yes. So I understand it, and I so like I find myself in the middle where I make art and things. I make the physical map. I make character art for people, um, but I don't necessarily bust out battle maps. I think it slows things down too much, especially mm-hmm. online. But I, in in regards to like, because I feel like everyone has an idea of what their character looks like. Yes. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So it's like it's different. It's different from like watching a show, you know. Because if the show is vague, then like you know, yeah, you're gonna get all of those interpretations. But I think like with your friends, it's like after a certain amount of times, like you you know. Your friends know what they look like, so then when you do an art piece, so, like, I very recently just did this, like, little four-page comic thing for my Saturday game. Yeah, we saw. Um, And uh, I, like, put it up there, and, like, I had people all over there being like, oh, my... Because a lot of them hadn't had art of their characters before, so they were like, Mm. oh, my God! That's him! That's me! (laughs) And, like, that's great. So there's definitely like a place for it. It encourages role play. Uh, I I like visual aids. I think it it mostly enhances, but can slow things down. But if you want that like slow tactical game, you have to. You, you, I think you have to use minis because then you're doing your line of sight and you're actually counting out mm-hmm. the space. And it's the same thing with Roll Twenty because like Roll Twenty has the maps and you technically have a mini that you can like do the ruler and yeah. stuff so it's, it's it, yeah. it applies to both the virtual table and, and then the real life table yeah and like from a dm's perspective it's like there's nothing greater than being like and then you see and you reach down and you get the big mini and you go <laughs> and they all go no! <laughs> so it's like those those moments are harder to do if you're just like and you see a and you like describe it so even then people like you know normally you'll put like a picture if you have art of it like you see this This. and everyone's just like fuck or what the fuck is that we did did. yeah and like that's great that's peak D. &D. (laughs) yeah what about you uh jim what are your thoughts on uh visual or audio stimuli um i i prefer minimal on the the visual However, with the game that I DM, it's for a bunch of kids from my church, Aww. and so these these kids are very visual, right. and so I yes. have to kids I have to definitely... have all the stuff <laughs> ready for them. But if I'm ever just doing like a game on the fly, I do prefer to have a few visuals. Usually, I will try to find some type of approximation picture that they can build off of in their mind. Uh, but normally, like for like on whatever map that I sketch out on a piece of a pad of paper, I'll have like coins or something that represent, you know, the, the, the different, uh, the, the different, uh, PCs or NPCs. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then everyone's like holding on to the little card that I have made them that has a little picture of their character. No. So they can keep in their mind, you know, something that they look like. And, mm-hmm. uh, then they, the, the, whatever is representing them, uh, on the badly drawn map, uh, but I really do love to uh, rely on, on on vocal and 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 musical cues. So, like, I'll, I'll try to find music to to play like off of my phone, like right next to me, you know, for a battle or for something. And especially for when I'm making NPCs, is I really try to find vibrant sounds. Uh, to describe these NPCs, uh, and 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 usually th- those were the ones that my players get the biggest kick out of. It's like, oh, Mister Jim, I love that that huge voice that you did, or I love this the the scratchy nasal thing that you did. And so it's like it's it's really fun to see the kids come alive based mm-hmm. on the sounds that I'm making, mm-hmm. or just even like foley work. You know, right. just saying boom. Boom, he steps closer to you and they just they they see their eyes get really big and they're like oh he's gonna he's gonna, he's gonna mess this up uh, yeah 
I would agree with that because my first experience with D&D, I was in elementary school and my uncle would DM for me and my cousin. And I remember this one session, we came across this tomb and there was like a rolled up letter and the let like he had done the letter like you would do old style like he burned it and put tea on it so it's got like that nice. that faded look yeah. and he wrote it out in like really nice cursive and of course we can't really read cursive so he kind of had to help us read it but like it was so like the ancient he, scripts right yeah, so he <laughs> check like, your, hands check it your to us. can anyone read cursive Right. Yeah. It's like, can anyone read this? Oh, I don't know. We were we were young, so like he had it was, and it was just the fact that like we could hold this burned piece of paper with like the faded lettering and stuff. It was like so real, and like even though we had our minis on the map, like having those type of like tangible items that your DM just pulls out of nowhere. He's like, here. Especially as a kid, you're like, this is so cool. How did you make this? Like it it just blew our minds that he spent time to make it, and we were so like floored by it we loved it um i'm also yeah. on on this on the scale of preferring theater of the mind for battles like it does help to have a map to see where exactly you are I, i'm kind of in the middle but i prefer theater of the mind just because it goes quicker and i'm more of an rp based mm -hmm. player so that's where i stand on that in terms of visuals for character art I love character art and while I love Taz and I love that it's so fluid and you can it, and fluid and flexible for Taz and what the characters could look like because it's fluid in so many ways in so many ways and it's purely an audio based like audio podcast mm -hmm. so you you have no other stimuli but the sounds and what they're describing but when I'm sitting down at my Storm King's Thunder if I didn't have the audio visuals or of what the characters actually look like, I would just assume they look like what I'm seeing on the screen. Mm. Like Mulfin would look like Matthew, uh, Diana would look like Zoss. Like it, but now that I have the visual aid of what their characters look like, I can actually see in my mind's eye because I've played with them for so long. You actually look like a fucking tiny gnome that's really fucking annoying, but I see it in my mind's eye. Like I can see it. So I, I'm of the preference where I love character art. It helps me add to the characters and players that I'm either seeing or hearing on Discord. And, and that's kind of where I stand with that. And I know for me, like, I definitely, I didn't see a picture of the McElroys until after I was, like, well into Taz and had seen different character art for them. Yeah. So, like, I don't really like they don't look like how i imagine them i am like look at them and i'm like no but you're supposed to look like taco right <laughs> right i did the same thing i recently started so watching funny. my brother yeah. my brother and me on youtube I mean, and i'm like yeah, this yeah. is their voices in these bodies is <laughs> what is taco? happening like you're I know, not no, it's great. you're I not a taco, skinny you have a elf with a broom what, the, what who are you yeah also or like i umbrella? always get screwed up i always get screwed up that justin is the oldest <laughs> I know, like, right? No, you're not. You have to be the youngest. You have like, to be the I, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, uh, I guess I guess Travis does kind of look like the the like what you think Magnus would look like, a little bit more than any of the others. But yeah, yeah, just it's, those Magnus sideburns. So you just imagine that and beard and yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Taco and yeah, Taco and Merle, man. Yeah. I, I mean, I think. I mean, Merle's pretty. Looks pretty much like him, just shorter. I, I mean, I shorter think with a big, of, big beard. I think they found a really nice kind of like the. They took the trickle down of all of the kind of popular fan interpretations, and now with their comics, right. they've yeah. kind of established yeah. a pretty right. there good. Is, there is technically canon. a canonical look of them. Yeah. Now. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. And ah. so, like, yeah, and I think, I think that like they took. Oops. You know, like like uh, they kind of like funneled down the, the right, and the they took popular. inspiration from other people's designs and kind of just melded it into like something. If you look at like the old like official art of like what they did for like the cover for the podcast version, mm -hmm. like they they looked ugly. Yeah, I'm sorry. yeah. <laughs> One thing I find That's super so interesting. Bad. I don't know. If, sorry to I don't know that. how much people <laughs> like Taz, but um. When they were creating the official designs, and people were like, "Why is Taco blue and or bluish green?" and they were like, "They never set 
like a specific like skin color for him and they were like we love all of the different fan art that you guys have made with like a uh, Caucasian taco or a uh, black taco or an, like actually I don't know if I've ever seen an Asian taco um, <laughs> but they were like I think the I reason have. probably um, but they were like the reason that we're going with blue is because they were they didn't realize like how big it was gonna get and so like this person's name is Taco Taco and he's an idiot who is like not good with the family and they're like we don't want to play into like racial stereotypes if we give him a darker skin people are gonna be like oh he's an idiot mexican named taco like and his right. sister's name is chalupa like come on guys so they were like we didn't think about it when we started because we didn't think it was going to be anything big like it was seriously just like a little one-off thing mm -hmm. but now we've had to think a lot more about it and we would rather have a slightly different canonical right. view of him than what a lot of people have in their mind just so that we don't like alienate a large population of our fans and which i thought was really interesting how they were like still thinking about that how, how people have to treat artistic representation of characters for D, D shows that are very 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 popular like high rollers taz critical role versus 99 percent of what D, &D is which is, is yeah which is a small group of friends locked away Doing in a little in things a, you know, and talking about dick jokes yeah the difference <laughs> dick jokes what you for have the discord god so the audio technical difficulties don't happen <laughs> yeah the 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 discussion you have to have about visual representation in those two spaces is very different mm -hmm. because you're sure. one is one is you're reaching out to an audience and one is you're just hanging out with like right. your friends and Taz is so like even though Critical Role is highly produced I feel like Taz is even more produced because it's all audio and the the amount of mm -hmm. like post edit work that he did yeah was phenomenal oh yeah there's more there's more editing work involved. yeah it would be it would be like a four hour session that he'd get down to one and a half hours so right. and he has like griffin has said sorry i listen to a lot of like background stuff about taz because i love them me um, too yay another taz fan um they like <clears throat> listening to like the adventure zone zone um where they talk about sort of the behind the scenes, there's like, they were talking about how there is a few scenes that they have actually, like, mm. redone if, like, the audio wasn't good or if it just didn't work out right. They're like, with none of the big stuff have they done it, but there's just been, like, a few things that just, like, you know, just aren't interesting or just haven't worked. And so it was sort of interesting because everyone's like, oh, you have to have all the original stuff. And they're like, mm, no, this is it, a story. Taz, Taz, Taz they and, do... Taz is a show. Yeah. And right. Critical role, they've always said, is it's our game we just put cameras on. Yeah. yeah. And Lip, and I, Lip and brings up yeah. another good point. The same can be said about theater. The choice to have Hermione played as a black woman was mm. a very controversial choice. And I'm actually in the boat mm -hmm. where I was angry at it because fucking jk rowling has been pissing me off all this time saying oh she she i never actually said she was white yes you fucking did it's in the fucking book you said she had a pale face don't try to reverse say i was actually being inclusive this whole time no you mm -hmm. weren't she was always a pale face girl oh <gasps> sorry anyway. jk kind of weird jk honest. is really honest. weird getting yeah, on kinda in her ears. she kind of mm. flips mm. too much for mm. me I just don't like, I'm all for think, inclusivity with like the plays and I was fine with her like as an act of choice to make her a black woman. That's fine. I'm not worried about that. It's the fact that J.K. Williams saying, oh, by the way, she, I never actually said she was white. Like, well, yeah, because that's lying. That's lying. Don't say that if it's not true. Like just say that the, the theater people have made a creative choice to cast her as a different race and it's, it shouldn't be a big deal. You shouldn't have to justify why you did that. It's do I th yeah I, I think that the story I think the story is improved by her being black but I mean the cursed JK, child was it's, it's a fanfic JK, and a play JK, really you didn't, so you didn't, but but JK just don't yeah just lie stop. and say you were more inclusive than it's, you were it's kind of like everyone's oh, freaking out about her focusing I on think I, like the gay characters like, and stuff and trying to be more inclusive with uh, Muslim characters that weren't even mentioned and I'm like where are these people coming like, she what? just making it black. up as she go Ooh, girl. but I just I love Black Hermione I do I too well, she, she was great she's, I do love she's doing an interesting thing from a writing standpoint is that she is 
really hungry to engage with her audience. Mm. So much so that she will continue to engage and to offer them something because she wants everyone to be included. And that's mm-hmm. awesome. I love that. But she she Does is it is doing it where, in a in a yeah, way it's how she's where doing it. she's doing yeah, mm-hmm. she's, she's doing it in a way that I think is alienating some people yes. because she she's dropping, you know, really cool things, you know, about them like, yeah, here's where this person came from and, and, and you know, here here's maybe an interesting tidbit about other people. But then she's offering like really, really strange things that that uh, that she's trying to retcon. Yes, retcon is exactly idea. the word I was thinking of. She's retconning. Yes. Yeah, it's like oh yeah, they just they just took a dump in the corner. Yeah, like what? What? No, no, no. Also, no, no, all no, no, the no, teenagers no, no. get really frisky because there's no sex ed. Like, I don't need to know that. I will don't say though, <laughs> we'll loop it. We'll we'll do we'll do the double loop back to D and D. If you if, if everyone <laughs> thinks if everyone is going to have a more fun time retconning something because everyone at the table went that was dumb. I didn't like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then then retcon it. Who gives? So, like, I mean, because I've been talking about, like, oh, we stopped in a weird place in Wish, right. and Christy keeps on, Christy keeps on going, ink. Just it's your retcon world. It. You just retcon it. Just make it. it go away. And I'm like, I can't. It's, it. it, it's fine. Awesome. Th- that's what D and D's about. And Lip yeah. was just saying, <laughs> J.K. Rowling should become a DM for that instant gratification. She can retcon all she fucking wants, and it won't matter. So it's great. <laughs> well, Christy, do you remember one of one of our best moments in the Sunday game was a retcon? Because you you were you were the, at the brunt of this, but it was Yuke's and Ashra's first kiss was a retcon because you had rolled to like run out, and I and then Lip was like, "You should grab her and stop her," and I like then Eric allowed us to retcon that I had grabbed you, and so yeah, best that's, moment. Yep, yep. Because I had already con. rolled to like get out there, and then when you said what what was happening, I was like, "Yeah." If she's doing that, she's not going to keep moving forward. Yeah, let's retcon yeah. it because it makes the most sense. <laughs> yeah. I love when a scene goes like three steps forward and then you uh, uh, like back. Take two steps right. back. And, yeah. you're like, and, you're, and you're like, and you're like, oh. that was all a dream. It you woke up. That's what I meant to do, but it never happened. <laughs> it didn't happen. It didn't happen. Not it happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did we get that. to question three? No, we're getting there now. <laughs> where are where are we? Where I'm gonna go turn on the light really quick, so I'm not in a cave anymore. One oh, second. Good, oh, good. Um, have you guys? Hello, darkness, my, my old friend. friend. Uh, have you been a techie backstage hand for any production? If so, what are some good moments to look back on? If not, is there a reason you don't? Uh. Hmm. I didn't do a lot of tech because I was normally, if I was doing tech, I was also acting at the same time. My my cousin Jessica, who went to school with me, was head tech, and she did everything. She had like the vision. I mean, she's gotten like awards for like her lighting designs. Like she kept with it. Good for her. Um, the biggest thing I remember doing was we did. Uh, uh, I did set design for Beauty and the Beast. And Ooh. what we thought about, what we ended up coming up with was we made these, like, four um, columns that were about maybe, mm-hmm. like, three by eight feet tall, and they were on dollies. And what you would do is, since there were four sides to each column, you would put them together, and we painted a background and then to do a scene, a scene transition, we just rotated all yes. four columns yes, I did to a different thing. face. Totally, it's and we so did it, and we did a different back. Yes, so mm-hmm. I love that coming shit. like. So I mean, I did, I did some of the, I did like preliminary, preliminary, uh, sketch work for what four we were going to do because we were like, okay, well, what do we need the most? So we had like, okay, we have the village specifically for the big opening number. We'll have. Uh, like two castle interiors we'll do like one for like the library and one for the west wing and then we did just like the forest i think and that was like enough mm-hmm. um and then i you know i mean like i helped like i put together the dollies and did the painting and the whole thing um and that came out pretty well i also showed them what uh because we wanted roses everywhere 
and they were like, we, it, you know, it's going to take so long to paint roses. And what I did is I got our spare cardboard and I made some uh, rose cutouts, like mm. about this, mm-hmm. this size. And we just started spray painting rose patterns onto everything. And then we also made a copy of that to put on our lights, on Ooh. our gel lights, so that we had the lights coming out in rose Color. shapes. Oh, that's so, so cool. Yeah. So, yeah, I, we, I did, like, cuts on the, uh, on the, on the gels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, God, but the money, that yeah, <laughs> The yeah. money, though. Um, it expensive. looked great. It looked great, though. Director gave us his credit card. <laughs> <laughs> That's dangerous. Party! Theater kid party is dangerous. <laughs> no, we needed the wine. Yeah, totally. Totally. It's a fair, it's a fair expense. What about you, Sierra? Um, I don't think I ever did any tech stuff. I think the most I did backstage. Oh, wait. Yes, I did. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Little Shop of Horrors. Since I was an understudy, I did um, I did help with setting up the stage itself. And I kind of did like the ticket thing where you just hand oh, out. Oh, yeah, ticket. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I also did hair. Ooh. Yeah. I couldn't do hair for real. So I just like straightened people's hair or bumped hey, it man. whenever they needed. It's part of the design <laughs> process. That's great. Oh, I <laughs> thought you meant the musical hair. Oh, oh no, well, not. yes, please. No, not that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, no. So yeah, that's mainly what I did. I never did okay. the design for the stage. Did you have any like favorite hard. moments that have happened like backstage, even if you're not like working? Uh, backstage, yeah. When um, <laughs> during <laughs> during a little shop of horrors, high school was wild. Yeah. Um, there was a scenario with like some drama going on between two actors Pardon one school. was um yeah. yeah one was audrey one was audrey and the other somebody else i think he wasn't even part of it he was stage and <laughs> they kind of got into like this little hectic back there because they was like you shouldn't be messing around with him like they had a romantic thing uh, um, yep and it Good was just like that. this is high school but that was just kind of fun to watch. So I guess, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, that was I was entertaining like, drama. <laughs> entertaining drama, and that was the show behind the, the stage. show. Yeah, yeah, the show behind so, the show. <laughs> yeah, has anyone I ever seen the show. play uh, Noises Off? No. Yes. So Noises Noises Off is if you haven't seen Long it, so all, all of you out there in internet land uh, is a really great play, and I think a movie as well, where it's. It's the behind the scenes of a stage play. And so it's like everyone is like they come off of the set and then they argue and they argue and then they go back on to to be their characters again. That's Mm -hmm. great. I would love that. Yeah. But it has to be noises off because the play is ongoing. And so they're like, like, I can't believe you did that. Right, right. (laughs) Yeah, I think everyone has like a backstage story. Because for me, like, so I did both acting and um, tech stuff, and I have the wonderful ability of being able to solve a Rubik's Cube. Um, And a lot of the shows we did were, um, they had kids involved in them. The youngest person that I worked with was five. And it's really hard to keep little kids, especially a lot of little kids for, Mm. like, the King and I or Oliver, Mm. quiet backstage. Yes. Especially because a lot of little kids were monsters. Um, Yes. And so we figured out, because I would do my Rubik's Cube backstage, because I, like, needed something to do with my hands, but to be quiet. And I would end up with this little ring of kids around me just sitting, staring at me. And so I would bring two. And I would solve one, give one to someone to mess up. Once, like, I was done, I would give it to the next person, take that one back, solve it, give it to the next person. Oh, that's such a good idea! I could keep it entertained for hours. It was so good. And then, of course, the stage manager, who was <clears throat> a witch, um, was like, they're blocking the walkway. And I'm like, yeah, but they're quiet. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty good. Um, but yeah, I think everyone has sort of that little backstage story of the drama happening backstage. What's yours, oh. Ink? Well, 
there's one of me yeah, from being one I can tell. Yeah, well, I'm just one looking of, at Ig's face, and I'm like, what has he got? <laughs> well, there's one of me from being an actor, and then there's one of me being tech. So technically, the question is tech. Uh, so tech thing, it was also Beauty and the Beast. And so this was high school. I think it was junior year. Now, I was playing... Uh, let's see. I was playing Maurice, and then I was playing a couple other background people. Tried out, tried out for Lumiere. The guy that always beat me for the part I wanted got Lumiere. Whatever. Fuck you, Peter Williams. Um, <laughs> Getting called out. Hashtag not my Lumiere. <laughs> Hashtag not my well, Lumiere. Well, I mean, he, well, I mean, Hashtag not my Lumiere. Well, I mean, he literally had like the best ass in town. He also ended up going to school for <laughs> in New York. He ended up going to school for dance in New York, so wow. like, can I really, can yeah. I really blame him? No. He, he wanted it more. Um, but <laughs> anyway, uh, it was like it was high school. But I remember our hell weeks used to be like you were there till eleven o'clock mm. on a school night yep. in a high school. Yep. My parents would get super pissed off. But the thing is, we'd like we'd like do rehearsal, you know, line reads. <laughs> then all the actors are all like, and I'm saying this as an actor, but like all the actors get like sleepy and they're like, mm, I have homework, I have a test. So they all go home at you know like six <laughs> or seven and so then i just remember i just remember we like we had to do a whole light cue run light cue run through of the entire show and beauty and the beast has so many light cues and so, <laughs> and so i was like listen my cousin jess is on lights i have a car i will play everyone <laughs> <laughs> So I, pl I, we did an entire run through for, I think actually, I think we did an act, I think we did act two onwards, where I played every single person so that I could find my light. And we did, and we did our marks on, on the, on the stage for it. But it's like, I'm Beast talking now. And now I'm Belle. And now I'm Beast. And now I'm Cogsworth. And now I'm Lumiere. And I just—I played everyone. I played everyone <laughs> because because all the other actors wanted to fucking go to sleep. <laughs> he <Boom>. said no. <laughs> Hashtag tech life. <laughs> Hashtag tech life. Oh. And I have I have we Beast ended up staying a little bit later, and I have some pictures. I'll have to find them at some point of we were do testing the lights for his for his big solo. And there's two pictures. There's one of him just going like this, and then we do the light cue, and I took a second picture. His whole clothing reflected all the light, so he just looks like Jesus. Because he's like this with his arms outstretched. It's just a blaring white light, and it's the funniest fucking picture because I went to a Catholic school. And I'm nice. like, Jesus Christ! <laughs> oh, no. Jesus Christ, superstar. So it was great. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Jim, do you have any? I have a couple. Uh yeah. So I can't remember, I cannot recall which play it was that I was doing in high school. But I got to be, I guess, the blocking director. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, and so blocking was a lot of fun, just making sure everyone's standing in their friggin' spot. <laughs> Because they, like they put tape on you have the floor no for idea. a reason, people. <laughs> yeah, just put, putting the tiny little you know, it's, I had I, I and I had to have someone help with this because I'm colorblind, <laughs> but I I worked out a system to have a colored dot uh, for for some of the different uh, mains, mm -hmm. and, and so like each main character would go to stand, you know, in their place. So I had to have a, a person work out a chart with me. Uh, about which person was where because it was my system that I made, but I'm colorblind and so. It's, oh it's the whole thing. wow! Uh, but the best part of that was I got to choreograph a couple of fight scenes, uh, one one unarmed and uh, one with rapiers. Ooh. And and so I I have a bit of experience from middle school where I I, I was a little bit into Olympic fun, fencing. Mm -hmm. And then later on, later in university, I got more into kind of, you know, HEMA style things, you know, the historical European martial arts. 
and like mm, studying yes. like how people actually fought and actually moved. And that's been really helpful with with writing and storytelling is that if I'm writing an action scene, I'll be able to get up and kind of like work out like, you know, how, how would they be able to move and fight? And so me and me and a buddy who was my kind of my helper to help choreograph, you know, the reverse of, of, of the fight scene, we watched almost every sword fight scene that we could find trying to pick the best bits and and so is, that's what you do. Is that you, yeah. you find you find the cool the cool stuff, the flashy stuff. Uh, and so we were able to. We we worked out this epic scene so much so that the actors could not do it. Oh no! Which was stupid because like we we managed to get you know two F, really athletic looking uh, guys, but they were just gym rats. <laughs> They, they they couldn't do anything. They they could they could do this and, <laughs> and this, but they could not manipulate the wrist. Like they had no idea oh, how. Wow. To, they didn't even know how to. They didn't even know how to hold a fist. Like I thought, I thought gym people were supposed to be tough. But no. they, they, the one guy, the they one guy made a fist. He, oh, he did this. No, no, he never, never. no. That's no. A broken thumb. And I, I, said, I, I said to him, I was like. I know you think that I have nothing to do with strength. I assure you that I do. But if you hold your hand like this, you're going to break your thumb. And, and he just looked at me like, yeah, whatever, geek. But uh, yeah, I, but I now showed you're it to him. Like, I, 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 <laughs> yeah, but like what, what I did is I, I bought. We had we had a couple of those. Um, <laughs> Like practice punching pads, like you like you see like boxers boxers use in the movie. Mm-hmm. You know, one, two, and I I said to him, I was like, okay, I'm gonna hold my hold this on my hand. I want you to punch me like that. No, do not use full strength. He's like, yeah, whatever. And he punched really really hard. He did not break his thumb, but it was darn close. And afterwards, like he was just like icing his hand, going, okay, so how do I hold it? It's like it was just it took him a moment of almost not hurting know? himself. I have He's no like, idea. I can't I even remember his name. I, I'm really sorry if if you're if, if you're out Never there listening to this hands. now and thinking that I'm bad mouthing you. I'm really sorry about that. But you did not know how to hold a fist in high school. You were a freshman who uh, knew how to lift the heavy thing. But I was the I was the senior who knew how people actually move when they fight. Right. Right. Because I had some oh, experience yeah, with that, so and so deep. that that's was like rule number one. When you go in for the first <laughs> lesson of karate or any martial arts, rule number one is you learn how to hold a yeah. fist, and rule number one yeah. is don't put your thumb inside your hand. Like it's oh, yeah, wow. And, and My so, brother taught me that but, when but he was teaching the, me out of box. Yeah, mm. right. And for, mm, and for the sword like fight, box. it was it was as princess bridey as you can imagine. Oh, I we love were it. jumping off of set pieces. Oh, yes. and, nice. And and it was it was wonderful, but we had to really scale it down. Like I, I we showed we showed our we showed our teacher, our director, and he absolutely loved it. He like he he said, uh, "I'm sorry that we can't show this, that we can't have a costume change, and you two come out because you know Jim Jim, you're about the same height, but you know my other friend Brent, he was he was much smaller mm. than the other guy." Uh, he said, I wish that we could do a costume change and you two could come out and do that. But we have yeah, to, we have to, you know, yeah. we have to, we have to bring it back a little bit. It's, it's one of those kind of bittersweet moments where it's like, I created something really cool, but they couldn't, deliver. but we couldn't use it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah they couldn't deliver. Yeah, I actually sad. have a stage fighting story as well. <gasps> um, I had done fencing for years um, and we were doing Peter Pan and I was a pirate and the person that uh-huh. I took fencing from was also a pirate and was doing choreography for the fighting scenes. And no one else in the show had done any fighting before. So he's like, I'm going to have it be you and me. Also, I'm left handed, which works really well because we could go against each other and both be facing out. Mm-hmm. He's like, you and me, we're going to do a little like extra fight sequence because we can do more than everyone else. Um, and so how it started was I, w- I would grab his arm and throw him on stage. You know, first art of stage combat, you don't actually pull, you let them do the thing. Right. 
Well, I managed to dislocate his arm. Oh no! Um, because we were going to do it, and I like I wasn't pulling hard, but someone like called his name or something from backstage, and so he like sort of pulled away to like oh. look, and just like and so, but I didn't know it, so I'm like throwing him on stage, dislocate his arm, so he's now like one handed with his arm in a sling, <laughs> fighting, and it's just like, oh god, I'm oh, so sorry. No. Kirk. I, yeah. our, I am also I am also not left handed. Our <laughs> fight our fight choreography the only t- I always come back to Beauty and the Beast. The only time we actually got a fight choreographer was Gaston versus Beast in Beauty and the Beast. Every other time it was done by our dance instructor. Yeah, it makes uh, sense. And mm-hmm. but a lot of times it wasn't acting. They just had these little private school high school kids actually like beat the shit out of each oh, other. Shit. Uh, so I remember, I remember I I'm I'm Bill Sykes for Oliver. <gasps> I'm doing my That's name. True. We're in. We have the our our set is all like made out of like it, it. You know, we have like a whole like jungle gym bar for people to like climb on and and things like that. And there's like rise and there's risers and it's all it's all like pipes, but it's not really pipes. And I was supposed to, in the beginning of my name, grab a dude by the by the shirt, do some singing into him, shove him away again, and he's supposed to, you know, the same thing, throw himself back mm-hmm. into the like wall, right. right? So we're right at the top of my of my song. I'm doing it. Pull him in. I throw him. He throws himself back. Hits the pipe. Pipe breaks. Falls off the riser. <sighs> falls off. Falls off stage on his back. And I'm just like, uh, applause. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. The show goes on. The show goes but on. But then, but and, and I mean, like, so like, I I was supposed to have a like what like he's supposed to have like a Billy Club or something. He like, yeah, yeah, beats yeah. people. <laughs> they didn't, but they didn't want to give me a weapon. So when it was time to kill kill somebody, I just had to choke her out. And so I'm just I, I'm just choking Nancy to death <laughs> and she's a freshman and the issue was they would be like it doesn't look like you're choking her it doesn't look like you're choking her and I was like and they're like you know do this a little bit and then she starts being like <laughs> and I'm like and then I got in trouble and I'm like well the director doesn't know how to tell me how to fake choke somebody you know hold them like right, down like right. here yeah, yeah, yeah. and he's like he's like eh. so there was that that's two and then three, I get shot, and I'm supposed to tumble down the risers as if I'm, like, falling down, because mm. I'm, like, trying to run away. I get shot, and I, like, fall down the stairs in the middle. No pad. I don't have knee pads under my clothes. So it was just fall down the... Because it was just fall down the stairs. And I literally <laughs> would just throw my weight down the set of st- Fall down the risers, tumble, tumble, tumble. And it was like, all right, let's try it again. Aww. Let's try it again. Let's try it again. Bruce, knee, knees bleeding, bruised, because I'm just being told to fall down a set of stairs <laughs> like 30 times. It's, but, it's funny you mentioned that. It looked real because it was. Because when I was in actually in Japan, like it, we were, on, I was on a music video set for um, Monobrite, and one of the scenes they had these girls jumping like pretty much like off this like mini trampoline and jumping and they wanted to catch the the shot of us falling <laughs> towards the camera and most of the girls were so like uh, uh, and they had to redo it so many times i did it twice and i committed and each time the director was like ooh ooh every time i landed because i slammed so hard but i committed yeah. i'm like i'm in a fucking music video i'm doing this shit and each time he's like right. that was really good but are you okay and i'm like i'm fine it's good. You just gotta commit. Adrenaline. Hey man, when you're in Japan, big in Japan, gotta do it. Um, when I was, but one of my backstage memories was similar to Inks with um the the backstage and the rotating um sets. Mm-hmm. Is we would have to stay really late to like paint a pirate ship or paint the forest or paint the hotel. So. Again, I like Ink, I was one of the only people that would stay late because I was one of the older ones and I actually am a night owl, so I'll stay. But I remember we had to draw a small version of it and put it onto a projector, like on a on a 
transparent piece of paper and put it onto the projector to make it like even bigger so we could just trace mm -hmm. the outline. And the outline was so high that most of us were short, we can't reach the top. So my teacher, because I'm so small at that at age, like elementary school, high school, I was pretty tiny compared to everybody else. He put me onto his shoulders and we spent like an hour, me just on his shoulders, just painting. And I, <laughs> I remember feeling like, I'm so tall. <laughs> it was great. The only time in your life. The only time in my life where I appreciated being a short, tiny, weighed nothing, zero pounds. Like, ah, I felt like I was on the top of the world. It was great. I always love when you're able to convince the audience that, like, you've, like, are so into the character. Like, with Christy, with you saying with the director. Because we did, when I was in, um, uh, Pied Piper, um, obviously my children got stolen away. And I would run out on stage after almost killing myself on this set of Spiral Staircase backstage. Um, and then, like, run into my husband's arms and start sobbing. And after one of the shows, we would go out and, like, do handshakes and stuff. And a lady came up and she's like, honey, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. She's like, you just, you I look so sad. Aww. She's like, I just, I was worried that you were really crying. Aww. No, I'm, I'm fine. That's so sweet. I did almost kill myself because it was, like, this spiral staircase that's, like, a full um, height, but only, like, three quarters of a turn to get oh, down. No. And the stairs why? are, like, this wide. Yeah, why, why, why are... Why are all backstage staircases oh. either spiral staircases or stairs this wide? I know. There's no lights. Yeah. yeah. There's well, with this no one, lights. It's so with dark this one, it was there. because we like have this one set of really cool spiral staircase stairs, and like sometimes they're on stage, but if they're not, we use them for easy access upstage or backstage. But the thing is, I was wearing this. I don't wear skirts. I hate skirts. I'm not good in skirts. But I was wearing this huge, huge skirt that had like three layers. Oh no! And so I would pretty much just like slide down. I didn't even really like step down. I almost died like three times oh, during that because no. I had about three seconds to get from like a balcony out, close the doors, down the staircase, open some other doors, and run into center stage. <laughs> it was great. I didn't almost die almost every night. What are you talking about? Uh, this will probably be one of the last questions since we're running a little bit late. But um, we spoke before about lore building in the previous episode and how it relates to scripted culture. Do you feel your creative t your creativity is stifled or inspired by work already created? Do you prefer creating materials for homebrew campaigns versus pre-written modules? I think Sierra kind of touched on this a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do like the homebrew more, to be honest. I like having homebrew because it's kind of... I like modules, but I feel like modules are a little bit limited on, like, how you want your story and how you want the character to develop mm -hmm. and the type of path that you would like to take. Like, I like the homebrews just because, um... I don't know, I like investing... And everything that people are not really expecting. It's like you might write something a little bit in your backstory that mm. you'd be thinking it's like, oh, it's not that big of a deal. And then boom, like yeah. someone make it out into like, this DM. Whole... like this. That's yeah, so true. Like... My DM, Eric with Ani, I wrote like as a little like homage to Scanlan, my exactly. love for Scanlan. I'm like, oh, she had a crush, a fleeting crush on a gnome bard that she saw at a distance, never talked to him, never met him. She just saw this gnome bard and thought he was really cute. And in my head, I'm like, oh, it's Scanlan Shorthall, like, in my head, being, being me. Scanlan. And then fucking Eric is like, Christy, meet Yukes, a.k.a. Ani. You recognize Yukes. I'm like, what do you mean I recognize? This gnome, you've seen him before. And I'm like, fuck me! Fuck! It's, that, it's like that little thing that you never really expect. It's and so then tiny. I just like the whole lore thing. I like how creative you can get with home groups because you can find so much stuff you like people may take inspiration like from like let's say dragon age they'd be like oh here's a blood mage but it may work completely different in this world in D, D or something so it's i prefer homebrew because you can just get very creative very open and some people just you throw out a little bit little surprises out there and it just be wowing your audience so i love it do you feel like the modules or like written pre-written works are stifling for that creativity or do you feel like you can still kind of bend with it? You can depending on the DM. 
to be honest. Like, I feel like I had been in, I've been in both games. I've been in where a DM was going strictly by the book mm. and it was just like, this kind of boring. Mm. And then I got a DM who only do modules, but he's able to twist it to make it personal to us. Yes. Mm. So it's like, so I'm true. invested in the story, mm-hmm. even oh. though the ending may be different or you can see like it's still similarity like Curse of Strahd. Right. I ran the Curse of Strahd module before and it came out to a point where my character even went from chaotic what was it chaotic neutral to chaotic evil throughout that thing. And I was just like how he did it was because, oh, you've been looking for your sister and you can never find her. And hey, now she's part of Strahd. And I'm just like Well damn. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Rail is gonna be evil. <laughs> no. Rail is secretly no. evil. Not Varian. Everyone no, is evil. Just every- let y'all know. Everyone is well, gonna be evil. Everyone, every everyone in our Curse of Strahd party, I'm quite sure thinks like Varian is gonna be the one that like turns because <laughs> he's because everyone's like I don't think that. Like, everyone, Rail doesn't, but a lot of people are like you steal things and you you know lie to people and he's like i've never lied first off and i didn't steal i looted <laughs> <They weren't, laughs> there's a difference <laughs> they weren't alive anymore they weren't alive Fighters anymore. keepers okay now. <laughs> yeah everyone in this is <laughs> but um i think that uh modules are really good to put into your like like run your homebrew campaign and then just take it's like it's like if things are like you know stalling out then mm. you just secretly slip then just don't even tell them that you're now playing a module just slip it in mm-hmm. change characters names change some you know like a lot of them are vague enough yes that you could just kind of or vice versa where you start with a module as a starting platform like as a starting mm-hmm. point and just be like Okay, well, you started there. Doesn't mean you, that's how the rest of the story is going to go. Kind of just like meander it away, which is kind of what happened with Storm King's Thunder. I mean, to be honest, <laughs> the, the players kind of derailed it and went on all these other side quests. But it was like we started as a Storm King's Thunder proper module starting campaign, and we are nowhere on book at this point. So I feel like both. I feel like there's a good way to mix the two, but I do feel like homebrew is definitely easier in terms of creative like process yeah definitely i mean for for me there was a game that i did uh where we started with a we started with a module i cannot remember i don't it wasn't an official module it was something i found online Hmm. but i i was running them through this module and i like to do things for my for my for my pcs is i like to give people the hero shot i like to give everybody a moment Hmm. Because I want everyone to be invested in what is happening. Right. And so I, for one of them, I had a ranger and he, he wanted to be, uh, I don't even know if he wanted to be a beast master, but I think I decided to give him an animal anyway. And so, um, here's what I did is that I set up kind of a dream sequence for each of my players and his dream sequence was he sees like an array of baby, you know, animals. Oh no! I want them all. <laughs> and, and and the and the one that he chose was he chose a a baby griffin, and oh, so like I found no. a homebrew for a for a micro griffin, which oh. was like the size of a sparrow. Yes. And I was gonna have this thing grow up to be this amazing monster, and this is nowhere in the module. But I decided then and there when he chose the griffin, I was like, he's gonna be king of the griffins. And so, like, I, I planned out this this whole plot line for them where they have to go up into these, like, mountains and they have to do aerial combat. And so it's just, it was one of those things where, like, because I'm trying to find this amazing moment where everyone has their time to shine, it really allows uh, space for creativity. That way everyone can be the hero of their own story. Yes. Mm-hmm. Cause I know that there, there are sometimes for, for a module where if you're following the module by the book, yeah. you'll, you'll have, you'll have a leader of the party. Yeah. But I, but 
you know, it, and then everyone else is kind of along for the ride. Mm-hmm. But I really want chances for everyone to 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 be the hero. To like for each of my players, like I won't I tell them, that. "Hey, you're the hero. You're right. the main guy." Right. But I want each of them to feel in their heart they are the main guy. Yeah, I, I, I'm, so I dig that. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, I dig that. I love that. So he ended up, yeah, he ended up being king of the Griffins. Nice. Uh, I love after that. after they saved uh, the Griffins from the dragons. I think I, that's like one of the best parts about when you're running like a module, and that's why I say it's depend on the DM mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. when DMs really do care about like yes. trying not to isolate and trying to include everyone to make it like, oh, this is your story, this is your story, this is everyone's story. Mm-hmm. It's it makes it to a point that oh, I'm not just here for the ride. I'm just not backup or I'm a side character because I feel like. If you think that you're the main character, you're going to be way more invested and you're going to be interested in the connections that your character has. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah, I love that. Uh, Any last thoughts? Because I I love that. That's a great way to end the show. But any last thoughts Mm -hmm. on uh, everything that we've been talking about? Any last stories? Anything you guys wanted to talk about? Be nice to your DM. Be nice to your stage crew. Yes. It's Show up if you're going to commit to a theater program. Show up. Or a D&D game. Hey, or a D&D Show game. up to your D&D game. Show up to your D&D game. And if not, do things in advance. Yes. Make sure you tell people in advance. Yep. Yes. And always try to have a backup plan. Yes. Or a backup. Yeah. If you're, if you're going to commit to something, commit to, you have to 95%. Like, you can miss 5% of rehearsals. Yes. Like... I mean, and obviously things like, change. Like, of course, yeah. life happens. You get sick. Yeah. Outside factors, outside stressors. Mm-hmm. Things are always going to happen. Of course, real life will always come first. But be respectful to the group you're with, whether you're in theater <laughs> or D and D. Give them the heads up. If you can't, mm-hmm. you can't. But just give them that leeway. <laughs> give them, give them a yep. little leeway so they can find a replacement if they need to. That's it's just basic respect. That's all. Yeah, just basic consideration. And that's true of both and theater be generous. and D&D. Yep. Yeah. Be generous to everybody because mm-hmm. everyone needs moments where they need help. Yes. Mm-hmm. And, don't and also don't be afraid to, to ask, ask for help. Yeah! <laughs> Audie! High five! <laughs> Always add. Yeah. <laughs> so good. Well, thank you to my guests, Ani, Sierra, Jim, and Inc. This was a great episode. Thank you to Lip for chiming in with uh, questions and starting up the questions. We missed you this week. Lip, lip. But we will see you next week. And I love you all. Remember, if you guys are donating bits this month, they will be going to the Zephyr Foundation in New Jersey for Autism Awareness Month. And that is all. We will see you guys next week. Okay, love you. Bye. Bye. Bye.